think about the time frame which brings us to the whole idea of long run versus short run, which I think is a very important component of demand. And I like to illustrate it using a very simple example, which is think about something like the demand for gasoline. And think about what, how we want to think about as economists about the demand for gasoline. So think about, so again, we're going to draw a demand curve. So this is going to be the quantity of gas here, and the price of gasoline is going to be here. And here's some initial price, P0, Q0. So that's my initial starting point. People are buying this much gas at this price. And then I want to say, well, what would happen if the price of gasoline instead moved up to here. That is, the price of gasoline increased dramatically. And we've seen this happen numerous times in history, right? The price of gasoline goes way up, goes way down. The price of gasoline has been very volatile. And, well, what would happen to consumption? Well, we know the law of demand would tell us that, well, if that's all that happened, that the price of gasoline got more expensive, people buy less gas. The law of demand is going to tell us that. The answer is, in the short run, they'll buy less gas, but not that much less. That is, the demand for gasoline, at least in the short run, is going to be relatively inelastic. So if I doubled the price of gasoline, which kind of looks like I did here, I might see the quantity of gas go down maybe 10%, something like that. Doubling the price of gasoline would lead people to consume like 10% less gas than they did before. Short run elasticity of demand for gasoline is a pretty small number, maybe like minus 0.1, something like that. Pretty low. All right? Now, a lot of people say it's completely inelastic, which isn't correct. People do conserve on gasoline when the price of gasoline goes up. How do they conserve? What are the major ways in which people can conserve on gasoline? Yeah. Okay, so one of the things people do is they take fewer road trips or shorter road trips. They go on a shorter vacation. They don't drive as far on a vacation as they would have otherwise. Okay, that would be one example. What else? Yeah, they might take the bus or take the subway, walk, do something other than drive. So both of these are drive less, right? You're going to drive less. Again, gives an analogy we used when we talked about cars and car maintenance. The activity that's being adjusted is driving less. So I would see fewer miles go down. So if we were going to achieve a 10% reduction in car and gas consumption, do we have to drive 10% fewer miles? Is that the only way we could consume less gas is drive fewer miles? Okay, but sharing is going to mean less driving, right? Because you two of you in one car rather than each in your own car. So carpooling would go into that drive less category. Yes? So you've got to replace your car with a new one. Well, less yeah, but let's assume that that's hard to do. Let's assume that's de minimis in the short run. Less aggressive okay, you could drive less aggressively. You drive a little <laughs> slower, right? You don't. You accelerate a little less fast when you leave the, when you leave, yeah, yeah, you can do that. So you can get better mileage in your car. Miles per gallon can go up. How else could I achieve more miles per gallon? Yeah. If I gas more often because otherwise you're hauling every gasoline around. Okay. And so, I knew that for some of the minivan. Okay, so putting less gas in your car because gas weighs something, right? Okay. But then you got to drive to the station. That, you got to trade that off. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but what else can you do? There's another thing that's happened over time. What? Ah, that takes time. I'm leaving that out. Somebody already suggested that. What? But many households have more than one car, right? That's one of the things that's changed over time. More households now have multiple cars. 
You can drive a different car. You can drive your better mileage car. Leave the minivan at home and drive the small car. Right? You could, you know, you could still take the same trip. It's just you're going to take your small car to work rather than your big car. Right? You can't necessarily change the composition of cars that we own overnight, but you can change the composition of cars on the road. See, that's the difference, right? Everybody get the difference between the two? It may take time to adjust the car fleet that's in the garage, but the car fleet on the road probably could change instantly, right? We can instantly decide that we're going to take one car rather than the other, right? I mean, literally, you can't do it while you're driving, but you, you, you understand. We can much more easily, in the short run, short run affect what cars we drive. And so that second effect has probably gotten more important as more, we have more and more multi-car households, right? That is cars, more ability to adjust which car you drive. But nonetheless, in the short run, there's a lot of things, there's a limited number of things we can do. Now, what would happen if the price of gasoline stayed up here? What would happen? Yeah. Yeah, or, or even just smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. And this has been a very important response, historically, of what people have done. Right? When the price of gasoline goes up, what happens? Sales of pickup trucks and things like that tend to go way down, and sales of more fuel-efficient cars go up. We would change this size. Now, you can do other things, too. You can build public transportation. You can move closer to work. You can do all kinds of things to respond that you couldn't do in the short run. So what would happen over time is we would move over to a point, let's call it here. That is, the response to that increase in price would be more elastic in the long run because we can do more substitution. There's more things we can do. Okay? All right. Again, this is where a production function effect is, I think, very useful to think about it because you can think about it as one of the major things that's going on here is the car fleet is changing, right? That's the idea of the production function approach. It's not, it's not some amorphous thing going on in the background. It's something I can see. I can see that the car fleet looks different when I got here than it was here. If you go back to the 1970s in the United States, the price of gasoline went way up. And if you looked at like the, the fleet of cars we had, it changed dramatically over the next, from the mid-70s to the early 80s. Basically, the eight-cylinder car basically was out of business by the time you got to the early 80s. Very few eight-cylinder cars being sold. Almost everything moved down to a smaller size engine. Okay? Now, what would happen, though, once we got here? So you might think of this as some long-run demand curve. And here's the short-run demand curve, right? So the short-run demand curve would be very steep. Long-run demand curve would be more elastic. What would happen if now the price was to fall back to where it used to be? In fact, this did happen. What would happen? Where would we go? Yeah. Just give me the short term. What would happen in the very short term? Okay, we would move along another short run demand curve. Right? We would move, there'd be another short run demand curve that would be, again, less elastic. Because, again, just think of it simply the fleet of cars is being held constant along that curve, right? Okay, now what would happen? Okay, let's assume, let's assume we went here, we moved over here, we came down here. Now, we're going to move back to the right, just like we moved back to the left. And I think what you're asking is, will we go all the way back to here, right? Well, why, why not? Yeah. What do you mean by, is it all about technology? 
it's really not about technology. It's really about have we changed things Permanent, some kind of permanent change to the world. And I think what's, I think, amazed people in the car market is how far back we actually came. Because when the 80s came around, when prices went way up, people said, wow, we became much more fuel conscious, we became much more energy efficient, we got rid of those big gas guzzling cars. Those are gone. They're never coming back. Then gas got cheap, and what happened? What happened to the eight-cylinder car that was kind of a dinosaur? It came back, right? The eight-cylinder car came back. There's a lot of cars that had. The ten-cylinder cars came back, right? We got, right? We I mean we we had a big taste for. We we didn't just say, well, this is permanent. We're never changing. In fact, we brought back a lot of gas guzzling type cars. Okay. Now technology did change. Engines are much more efficient than they used to be. And in fact, engines are much more efficient than they were. But what do we use that efficiency for? More power, more performance. Performance of cars has gone up enormously. I mean, a Honda Civic is a high performance car by historical standards. I mean, Engines have become, we, we, we have a very elastic demand for performance. And you know, as prices of gas came down, we found, yeah, we have this new technology, but we didn't use that much of it really to save on gas. We used a lot of it for performance. So it's, you've got to be careful. Now, I agree, you don't necessarily come all the way back. The key notion, though, is there's a lot more adjustment that happens in the long run than can, can't happen in the short run. And this turns out to be very important for many goods. Because while you may not necessarily respond much initially, you can respond a lot more as you've got more and more things that you can change. Okay? And cars and gasoline is a really good example of that. 